Hare Krishna, welcome back to Sankirtan On, your hub for captivating Sankirtan stories, practical tips and tricks, and boundless inspiration from around the globe. Powered by the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust and devotees like you, Sankirtan On is created to support the Sankirtan movement globally and keep the transcendental sound vibrations going. Every week, we have an episode that helps you connect with Srila Prabhupada's books by inspiring you to both read and distribute them. So let's get to it. Hare Krishna, everybody. Welcome back to Sankirtan On, our podcast that's run by the BBT for your one-stop shop for all Sankirtan inspiration. My name is Ran Das. I'm from Columbus, Ohio. I'll be your host for today. And today we're extremely excited to welcome Punya Shavana Prabhu, His Grace Punya Shavana Prabhu from uh, Toronto, Canada. Um, I met Punya Shavana Prabhu a few months ago when I stayed in Toronto for a bit. Uh, and we ended up, we, we, had, a, we had wonderful conversations. Um, and we said, okay, let's connect uh, and continue the conversations. Um, but I'm really awkward about finding excuses to do that. So this podcast is allowing me to do that. So it only took uh, a large organization for us to reconnect, but I'm glad we're doing it. Prabhuji, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Prabhu, and nice to see you virtually. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so just to start off, um, we'll be focusing this discussion on Sankirtan organization um, by Shikha Prabhu says the Canadian Sankirtan Yatra mainly headed by Toronto, is one of the most organized yatras on the planet. Um, uh, it's very glorious to just go out and send Kirtan on a whim and say, okay, we're going out and um, we're, we're going to just distribute books and please look through the Prabhupada and deliver the fallen souls. But when we do it in an organized manner, then our Sun Kirtan becomes so much more effective, um, both in terms of our personal growth and also in terms of the impact that they make on others. So we want to see, especially in the run-up to Badr Purnima, how we can go for that. But first, Prabhu, can you tell us a little bit about your background? How did you join Krishna Consciousness? Yeah, so I joined Krishna Consciousness in 2013. It's kind of been a very pivotal and defining moment in my life. It was just a few years after finishing my undergrad. I was starting my career. And I think like many people uh, in this day and age, you know, people have a certain set of ambitions. They want to make it in terms of going up the corporate ladder, um, you know, just have a good time at the same time. So that was my lifestyle. I was really, you know, occupied with spending a lot of hours at work, having some ambitions of getting promoted as soon as possible. And at the same time, a lot of my weekends were spent with hanging out with university friends and um, some of my schoolmates from elementary high school as well that I've kept connection with. Um, but sooner than later, I started realizing that that lifestyle of, you know, what they say, work hard, play hard, eventually caught up with me in a very, very adverse way. It affected me from a professional standpoint in terms of my workplace performance. I recall, you know, year over year, just doing my performance review and not really making it in terms of um, where I wanted to be. My own um, relationships in terms of um, friends got affected. And ultimately, uh, my health as well. And I had to take a couple months away from work just to kind of regroup a bit. And it was during that point in time that I really kind of started searching and wanting to pursue something higher. I didn't know what it was, but uh, I just prayed, prayed like anything. And somehow or another, I did come in contact with, with a copy of the Bhagavad Gita. And I remember starting to read it. Um, you know, oftentimes when you're in a mode of distress, that's when you can really appreciate um, you know, life and what's available. So as I was reading the Gita, I, I really felt inspired and wanted to learn more. And it kind of prompted me to just find a little bit more about um, the nearest temple, the Krishna Conscious Temple, Iskon Temple. And I saw that there was one here in Toronto at 243 Avenue Road. And during that time, it was also Karthik. And there was a lot of programs happening during the weekdays. We had a program called Tuesday Sangha that was a small intimate gathering of like-minded devotees just reading, chanting, and I found it quite inspiring just because of how much of a difference it was from the outside world and the environment there and stepping into a nice blissful setting um, really helped me connect. So uh, I also found that, you know, a lot of times just growing up in a Hindu community, um, a Hindu household, we went to temples, but it was more ritualistic. Whereas when I went into the ISKCON temple, it was a lot of discussion on philosophy and I really felt connected to that. 
and was able to learn more and more. So just that first impression of being around nice devotees um, during Karthik and um, really kind of developed my own faith and wanted to go further and further. And I saw kind of the, the difference between the lifestyle I was living and the opportunity that was available with being around such um, exalted nice devotees. And that inspired me to go deeper and deeper. And after that, I just really made it a habit of coming to the temple um, on a recurring basis two, three times a week, and then gradually taking up more and more service as well. Wow, wonderful. So you you came on book distribution. Um, did Was that book like given to you like on the street or did you buy it or did your parents give it to you? Like, how did it come? Just for my curiosity. Well, it wasn't actually a copy of the Bhagavad Gita as it is. Um, it was more of a Gita oh. press version, but um, it somehow connected me to Krishna consciousness and ISKCON. So when I when I got the book, um, I just wanted to see where there was nearest temple, um, where in the, like there was worship of Lord Krishna, and that kind of brought me to ISKCON naturally. Um, so that was how I came connected. And then, of course, when I came into the temple, um, on that Tuesday program, just the devotees kind of stressed and highlight the importance of the Bhagavad Gita as it is, and you know why it was kind of the authentic version translated by Srila Prabhupada. And sooner or later, I, I got the copy and I really made it a habit of reading it um, continually, just day over day. And I did find quite a bit of a difference in terms of um, not only having the Sanskrit there, but the purports, which really made me understand um, what the verses were all about. So that's how I came connected um, through through books and just went, you know, more and more into um, the practice that way. Right. Yeah. I, I think I don't remember whose Sri Lupropa memories it was. It might have been as one as Gopalkar Shamaraj's. Um, but he said like one time he wanted to print um at the Kumbh Mela or the Magma or something like that. They wanted to print um they're just the Bhagavad Gita without the purports, just the translations. Um and Srila Prabhupada said no. We have to print the purports, otherwise people will misunderstand. But in your case, I mean, you got like the version without the without the translation, but I guess the purports provided that philosophical basis that you were looking for. It um, did, yes. Right, and and especially Bhagavad Gita, Prabhupada is very rigorous in terms of the philosophy, the philosophy that's discussed there. Um, so right. I think it's it's clear how it's made a very big impact. But um, that's that's nice. I actually didn't know that. Um, but I think <laughs> you had a very it's it's strong purpose of coming. Um, to Krishna consciousness, and and therefore you've become such a strong devotee. Um, well, I'm still working on, on being a, a strong devotee, but I, I think one thing that I do is um, even, you know, we all go through different um, ups and downs in our life, and I often look back in terms of, you know, where I was before coming to Krishna consciousness and um, what I have now, and it's just a, an opportunity to be um, grateful and um, just appreciate all the association that we have here. Right. Nice. Um, so also you mentioned that you started doing like some services at the temple. Can you describe when you got into like Sankirtan services specifically? Um, yeah. Just, uh, book distribution. How was that first getting into it? <laughs> yeah. So I was really engaged in Sankirtan service by, you know, our wonderful leaders, Radhamon Prabhu and his wife, Shama Mohini Mataji. They, um, they really have a knack of engaging devotees in the right way. And, um, I think they saw me in the temple on Sunday feast being engaged in different types of services and that I was coming often. And I recall they invited me to their house um, to have prasadam for dinner. And we really just got to know each other better that way. And they talked about their own journey to Krishna consciousness and how under the inspiration of His Grace by Sheshika Prabhu, they had started taking up leadership roles in Sankirtan here in Toronto. And, you know, for myself, I was just looking for a way to be more and more part of the community and do something that's, um, you know, blissful, meaningful, and um, being able to share, you know, something that had a heavy impact on my own life in the form of books with others. So it just naturally felt touched by what they were doing and just how gracious they were in terms of um, inviting me to their place, getting to know me better, and um, telling me what's available in terms of service opportunities here in Toronto and that it was not just a few devotees that was involved in Sankirtan here, but it was actually a growing congregation that was heavily involved. So it just felt um, like I can just be more and more part of the family. And 
that way I got I got involved. I learned about you know just the different aspects of book distribution by following some devotees on Sankirtan during the weekends, especially during our MSF or monthly Sankirtan festival. And um, just that ability to interact with people on the outside and see how they're touched when they receive a book and they share their own reflections about challenges in their life just made me want to go into it more and more. So I, I was really inspired by our leaders here and the growing congregation that's involved in, in Sankirtan. Nice. So it's it's more of like, it's a personal touch. Um, yeah. You see what drawn to the service, but draw the people that were doing it. Yeah, I, I think one thing I've, I've found over the years is just the relationships um, really help, you know, move along in terms of building out the services as well. And when you see devotees who really are um, getting to know you better and wanting to um, engage you in, in things that are of interest to you, you naturally feel inclined that way. So I, I really felt that when I came um, as part of the Sankirtan team here in Toronto. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really nice point um, about like relationship building and stuff. I think um, just as a younger devotee that's looking up to to more senior leaders, the projects that have been successful. Um, now, this isn't a set in stone rule, but the projects that have been successful are usually led by those who pri like, prioritize the people as part of the project and not just the project. Um, so like inspiring the people, taking care of the devotees that are serving in those projects. I uh, think it's a good reminder. Um, it's part of the way we can grow our Sankirtan communities is just to take care of the Sankirtan devotees um, and yeah. to inspire them. Um, I actually believe one of the other Toronto devotees were saying that a few weekends ago, when they opened the Muskoka Temple um, in Ontario, like the Sankirtan team went along, um, like they all went together and, and yes. went as a group. Um, yeah. I think, I think what we find over the years is, um, you know, like not only do we have our existing devotees who've served for, for so long, but we have a growing group of devotees that also just take part because they see the family, they see the camaraderie amongst the group of devotees. And they're like, I want to be part of that. Um, I want to be part of a group that, um, you know, can facilitate, you know, just loving exchanges can reveal their minds and confidence, all those things. And, can do things together as a group in terms of even just traveling outside the city um, and just sharing reflections at the end of the day. So when you see that, um, especially, you know, given that a lot of our congregation members are either working or students, they're really looking for that outlet at the end of the week to just um, be engaged and save up practically. And um, Sankirtan is always fun because, you know, you never know what to expect and it can be very, very interesting in that way. And I think people, um, just gravitate towards um, the type of service that's that's offered there. That that novelty to it. Yes. That kind of leads us into the discussion here um, about organized Sankirtan. So I guess also, like, how, what's your role in the organization of the Toronto Sankirtan team? Um, and then, like, what, what have you seen are, like, the nice, the, the different strategies that are used um, in order to properly organize Sankirtan? Yeah, so we've got a pretty large group of devotees that help with the organization side um, because there's a lot of things that go into kind of leading up to the festival itself or, you know, just our Sankirtan outing. So one of the things that I'm heavily involved in is, um, you know, just the back end support work that's required. And that means, you know, making sure that we have adequate supply of books that are available you know, identifying any books which need to be ordered from the BBT and doing it in a timely manner so that we can have it available um, ahead of our outing as well. Um, in addition to that, there's additional services like packing of books um, for each festival. And each festival has its own unique flavor. We may be um, in different parts of the city and there may be different demographics. So it's also just using the right level of judgment in terms of what books will be appropriate for which given festival and putting together a list, um, engaging devotees to pack. Uh, and then there's also other services in terms of the end to end, which is, you know, once the books are packed, they have to be transported. We need drivers to help um, carry the books from the temple to the festival site. And then of course, um, arranging for prashadam for the devotees attending. So it really, really spans end to end. I think when I look at a Sankirtan organization, you know, one of the things that we do is 
of course, we map out the dates of the festivals itself and we communicate it. But there's a whole bunch of activities that happen leading up to that event itself, which is, you know, looking at what books are required, uh, which books need to be packed, who will be involved from um, a SEVA standpoint to help with the support, who can drive, um, help arrange prashadam, uh, make sure that we have adequate staffing. And sometimes, you know, some festivals go later in the evening, so we may need some devotees to stick around and, you know, just help with the wind down of those activities and so forth. So there's various sets of activities that happen as far as organization. And um, one thing I I really enjoy about doing these services, um, whether it's book distribution or even some of the backend activities, is that um, you really feel that end-to-end -end connection. Um, you know, when you're distributing the book, you see the efforts that have gone in terms of packing it um, bringing it over and you see that it's not just um, it's not merely just being at the event itself but it's all the planning that goes beyond it and the organization and that um, it's a, really a team effort to get us there so I, I really appreciate that part of the organization side and um, also it's just I also feel like it's an opportunity to just utilize some of the things I may be doing from a workplace standpoint in Krishna's service so just, um, you know, just having a little bit of that project management background, um, taking on a little bit of a project for the Sankirtan team and engaging devotees really helps as well. Right. Yeah. I believe you're in like the financial sector or like, right. yeah. So then you you have some obviously like management, management potency. So then using that and applying it to Krishna's service, I think is, is nice. And I, I think also the services that like you're doing are also very inspirational because you can see how they make a huge impact. Um, when you just stay in in one area, uh, and you like you really like invest all your efforts in those in that area, um, and and you have to kind of it's it's a responsible service. Um, you have to you have to do it. Um, it's, it's very purifying just because you're always thinking about it. Uh, at least you're absorbed into it to some extent. Um, and and to doing all of those like end to end stuff. Um, as and... far as like one thing that I think was interesting, I, I guess this happens subconsciously at other festivals that. I guess is you're the first person who's actually mentioned it. You kind of stated that you have different like book sets. I don't know if you meant like different bundles of books or like different books altogether for different festivals. Um, like for our experience, whenever we go to like a more like a vegan cooking event, we load up on higher tastes yeah. um, because it makes sense. It's a cookbook. It's a it's a it's an event. Uh, but then there's some just general events where we take everything. Can you speak a little bit more about like which which events? what what like what types of books you take to what events um or is it more complicated than what i've mentioned or things on those lines no it's, it's similar to to what you mentioned you know toronto is a very diverse city with people from so many different backgrounds and you know during the summertime for example right now you know we get four or five months of really nice weather here and there's a lot of outdoor opportunities for book distribution so what we do is we attend various festivals that take place throughout the city and each festival has a unique flavor to it. It may be, you know, a festival that's more oriented towards Spanish speaking community. Some may be Middle Eastern, some may be, you know, a variety of um, cultures. So what we do is we make sure that, you know, what, we have a good understanding of where we're going and the type of audience that each festival attracts and just pack the books accordingly. Um, like you mentioned, Rancho Prabhu, like we do have a lot of vegetarian vegan festivals which are really popular i think in in north america and one of the books that we do take is krishna the vegetarian which is also very popular and and we just try to align the books that way um so just so that you know when people also see books in their own native language they feel a little bit more of that personal connection as well so i think we just really try, try to tailor the books based on the festival itself and uh, make sure that we have a, a good variety that's available. Um, just last week um, here in Toronto, you know, we we had a festival of South Asia. So naturally speaking, we took a lot of Indian language Gitas mm -hmm. and um, Bhagavatam sets in different languages and made sure that that was available and visible to the attendees as well. Right. So you're, you're having books that are like somewhat in touch with your audience. Yeah. Um, either the language or like the the content. Right. Um, right. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, 
I guess you've mentioned festivals a lot. So I think that's, I think more and more devotees are starting to get into festivals. Can you describe how Toronto started focusing more on festivals? Um, how, how you set up festivals, just like discuss things about getting into festivals and how to set that up. Yeah. So just to provide some more background on how festivals work, basically in they close off a portion of the city or a portion of the roads in the city and allow various vendors to come in and set up, you know, tents to s sell various products and services. So, you know, on our side, we have a book tent that brings all of the books that we have in the temple. And to go through that process of getting a, an actual spot at the tent, you know, we have a dedicated team of devotees that help with doing a little bit of research, you know, what type of festivals are available in the city getting a sense of the audience, the number of people that attend, um, other considerations like, you know, the registration fee and so forth. And what we do is we do a little bit of research. We discuss it internally to see if it's, um, you know, a viable option to move forward on. And once we do that, we submit the application, get the necessary approvals, and then we start our planning. And that planning means communicating it to the devotees you know, in Toronto about the festival that's coming up and giving them some background, the start time, the end time, the dates that it's taking place. And then we pack the books accordingly and, you know, really just carry forward um, with the festival that way. And sometimes we have cases where there's like two, three festivals in a given weekend. So <laughs> that can mean, um, you know, a lot more opportunity for book distribution, a lot more devotees to engage. And I would just stress the importance of communicating early in advance so that individuals know to block that time off in their calendar to show up for the festival as well. Um, and one thing that we emphasize is that it's a large team of devotees that we have, and it's about everyone each doing a little bit. So oftentimes we have devotees who may show up one or two hours during a weekend. Some may stay for the entirety of the festival, which is, you know, right morning till evening, but it's really based on the individual's um, desire and preference in terms of their availability. So summer festivals is a really nice way. Um, people are out and about, they're looking to um, find something of interest, you know, when they're walking through each tent and, you know, we have the best thing available. So it's just a nice way to interact. And um, I think the mood is always very positive when the weather's nice and um, people feel like, uh, they're, you know, open to having a conversation. So that's one of the things that we do a lot during the summertime is partake in these various festivals. Yeah, that's a good point you made about communicating to devotees. Um, I think that's something Vaisheshika Prabhu, His Grace Vaisheshika Prabhu has mentioned so many times, um, saying like, okay, like they, when he talks about how Sankirtan started at ISV, he says, okay, we did these MSFs. Um, and our first big leaf was telling people when the MSF was <laughs> more than like a few days in advance. Um, I believe we had a recent festival in Columbus um, and the devotee who was in charge of that, she was sending out reminders for weeks in advance, right? Um, trying to get scheduled devotees on books, devotees get making prashadam, um, devotees doing all sorts of things. But yeah. I think that goes a long way because that like sort of hypes up devotees as well um, yeah. to to get in there. And I, I think one thing I would add, Rancho Prabhu, on communication is for us, it really starts right at the start of the year. Um, you know, each year we have a planning session to identify goals, things that we want to do better, um, what are our objectives. And naturally, one of the areas that we focus on is, you know, what type of festivals do we want to pursue? How many outings do we want to um, participate in? And from there, we have a little bit of direction on how we want to go forward. You know, what does the summer look like? What does the winter look like? Um, what does the fall look like? And so forth. And then once we've landed on that, um, we really move forward on applying for those festivals and then communicating in advance. You know, we, we utilize a calendar where devotees can see everything that's happening during a given weekend. And I know that sometimes when you communicate something in January or February for an event in like April, May, people may forget. So um, there's never anything wrong with just communicating multiple times, especially when you're like one or two weeks away. And that time, you know, devotees will have more clarity on their schedule as well. And it just goes a very, very long way in terms of planning and making sure that 
everyone has an opportunity to participate because they've known in advance that um, we have an event taking place at a given time. So yeah, I can never, um, you know, place enough emphasis on the importance of communication. Right, that makes sense. Um, at least, well, even if you have like a really good plan, if no one knows about it, then it, it can only go so far. Yeah. Um, I think we've discussed a little bit about like the back end side. I think uh, my understanding is for organization, a you should assign somebody to it, um, and we should like clearly think about every aspect, like you do, like your like the end to end, as you said, like the books need to be ordered. How many do we have? To now the books are there. Um, how do they get there? What packaging are they in? Um, the devotees have prashadam, all those things. Can you also speak about the organization of the front end, as in the devotees themselves? How do you inspire them? How do you ready them? Um, how do you, like, I guess you've said, like, there's a lot of devotees involved. How did you get to that point where there's so many devotees involved? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, like, just having been part of the TST or Toronto Sacred group over the years, um, you know, we've always had devotees who are eager to participate and join the team. And I think after COVID, we saw, you know, just our congregation grow quite large as well. And we had a lot of um, students come forward and say that they'd like to be engaged in uh, service opportunities. And they're aware that Sankirtan is something that we do every weekend. We go out and uh, naturally they they felt like this is a, just a nice way to take time away from my studies or um, work or whatever it may be. Um, so we, we kind of engage our book distributors. Um, first of all, we make sure that they're aware of the events that are taking place. We have a participant sheet that gets circulated, you know, a few weeks in advance, where anyone that's interested in book distribution can identify when they're available. And that helps us understand, you know, just from a staffing perspective, do we have enough devotees available at a given point of time? Um, how many books we need to pack? How much prashadam we need to arrange? And I would just say that in order for us to get there, it's also important that, you know, devotees also are aware of what to expect in the festival itself. So we do provide a little bit of background. We hold training sessions periodically on book distribution. Um, sometimes we do, you know, live demonstrations. I know Radhamon Prabhu and Shamoni Mataji did um, a presentation here at ISKCON Toronto um, a few months ago to give some background to newer devotees who are looking to get involved on what that looks like. So training, is important. And then we just encourage devotees to just um, come along. Don't feel pressured that, you know, you have to distribute a certain number of books. You can just follow along from some devotees who've been involved in the past and just observe. And then naturally devotees will see the enthusiasm that the book distributors have and newcomers will want to, you know, try it themselves. So it's a really safe, fun environment to get involved and um, one thing that we see is once devotees who are newcomers go, they often message us and say, when's the next event? When's the next festival? Because they're really just looking forward to that opportunity. And that enthusiasm is, is really contagious. Um, you know, sometimes when you're distributing over the years that you feel that energy that's coming from someone new and you just um, it just kind of allows you to be enlivened more and more so. One thing we do is we hold the periodic training sessions. We give some background on the festivals in advance um, and the, um, you know, share the participant sheets for frontline book distributors to get involved as well. But one thing I would add to Rancho Prabhu is that it's not that, you know, there's a certain group of devotees that um, just take care of the back end activities and then the front end is a different set of devotees. A lot of times devotees are, are doing both those activities Right. Um, what I what I find is that they really feel connected to the mission. Um, you know, even if they're doing if some of the back end work with ordering books, packing the books, and naturally they want to come to the festival itself and see how that is. So a lot of times, sometimes devotees are a little bit shy at the beginning, especially newcomers, to want to come out on the streets for book distribution. So they'll get involved um, with some of the back end activities, but over the weeks, over the months, and over the years, as they um, get more and more involved, they feel that inclination from within the heart that I, I want to start taking up book distribution um, on the front end as well. 
and we see that progression. So it's really, really inspiring when we see a newcomer and um, they're taking on more and more responsibility and being more and more engaged in service as well. That's actually very interesting because you guys don't have to really tell anybody to join it. Uh, you don't have to like be like, okay, this is why you should distribute books. This is why you should do this. I'm sure there's some of that, but really it's just that it's natural. It's that people go on book distribution. They come back really enthused um, and then other people see them and then they get excited. Um, like Vaishishi Prabhu always says like Sankirtan is high sadhana. Um, Cause I mean, for at least, at least my perspective, I mean, obviously it is a preaching activity, but I think it's also a very, very potent sadhana activity because it teaches humility when you get rejected on the streets. Um, it, it really humbles you um, and it purifies you and you make such a big sacrifice for Lord Chaitanya that he's, I, I was speaking to a friend a few months ago and he said, sometimes we feel like we're blackmailing Krishna. <laughs> that we're, we're like saying, we're going to go and talk to so many people and get rejected in so many ways that Krishna just has to reciprocate with us. Um, right. so that other people just see that enthusiasm and then they are willing to do it on their own, um, which I think is, is very, very nice that that's the culture there. Um, and and I think that it, it so I guess put, making devotees feel happy during Sankirtan um, by providing them training sessions that that helps them grow, um, and and I think it's also nice how we like there's a there's a how you I shouldn't say we um, but how how you guys have a very organized setting for 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 gauging participation um, and saying okay like and and having that that repertoire that okay there's going to be something going on every saturday yeah. so you don't have to figure out when we're available <laughs> because we're always available um so you just tell us when you're available and we'll fit you in yeah um, having and that I, continuity is powerful yeah I, I like the the reflections you shared and you know one thing that we also do is we take a lot of photos you know share a festival recap at the end just to kind of draw on the highlights of each event and we we communicate that to our various WhatsApp groups. We've got one dedicated for the Toronto Sankirtan team. And, um, you know, some of the devotees that are on the group may not have come for some time, but once they see that, they feel enthused and inspired to, to get more and more involved. And, you know, one thing that we also do is, you know, we just share reflections in terms of experiences that we had during the festival uh, as a group. And then when we get to hear from each other on unique stories from Sankirtan, it's like, wow, like that was really, really amazing. I um, never thought that someone can share something like that and um, be so inspired to take books. And it just makes us um, want to go out more and more and see just effect the positive effects that it has on, you know, the society at large as well. So it's, it's really, really blissful. And um, I think people naturally become enthused when they see all the positive um, stories that come out of book distribution. Right. I think, I think now, I think I'm, I'm, I, I think one thing that I'm seeing here is there's a big emphasis on the relationships um, devotees make with, with each other um, on Sankirtan. There's that very famous verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Ishvara tad adineshu balisheshu dvisachute prema maitri kripa peksha yakaroti samadhima. Um, my friends from ISV can at me if I if I mess it up, but um, it's it's describing a madhya madhikari, and I always think about this verse when I'm trying to organize my life because I like to think that I'm at least trying to be a madhya madhikari, and we understand that book distribution is pleasing to Lord Krishna, um, that's Ishvara prema, and then it also is very, it, it's showing mercy to the, the innocent, um, the four qualities of the madhya madhikari that they're they're uh, serving Krishna, they're friendly with the devotees. Um, they're merciful to the innocent and they avoid the non-devotees, the, the aggressive. But I, I don't think that second quality of um, of being being kind with the devotees and, and making those connections with the devotees, I never really thought about how we can use Sankirtan to, to enforce that. But now as you're speaking, I think some of the devotees I'm closest with are the devotees that I've gone on Harinam with, gone on Sankirtan yeah. with. Um, because then you all fail together, you all succeed together. Um, you can tell the funny stories about, oh, you met this prone person and they, they, they said this and you responded really snarkily, like something like that. Um, yeah. Things like that, where it's, it, it's, a, it's a bonding atmosphere. Um, and it creates such a beautiful connection among the devotees. Um, it, yeah, it really does. And I think, you know, 
sometimes we use the term sankirtan warriors because we're going out there on the battleground right. and we don't know what type of situation we're going to encounter but we know that we're in it together and we each have each other's support and that if someone is needs some help you know we'll be there to assist so it just builds that trust and love that we're all looking for in in our communities so i, I think that sankirtan is a prime opportunity and it's also there's also situations where we have to travel outside the city and sometimes we have two day three day festivals and we may be spending time you know, in another city away from Toronto. And in that way, we can build more and more relationships with devotees as well. We can have prashadam together. We can go for a, a walk in the morning, share reflections. So naturally, these things will happen where the relationship just becomes more and more solidified over time and um, just develop that love and trust. Right. So the bond, like, the, I guess the biggest thing for the organization, I mean, obviously, we've spoken about the back end and the communication and everything, but it's it's just facilitating positive devotee relationships among the Sankirtan and devotees. And yes. that way, everything else kind of falls into place. People are willing to, to go the extra mile. People are willing to keep things organized. Yeah. Um, yeah. One thing we do is we hold Sankirtan picnics. Um, oh, you know, nice. Periodically. So it's also an opportunity for all the devotees who are part of the Toronto Sankirtan team to come together. Um, we'll have Prashadam and just share our reflections, memories, and um, I think we all need that time to recharge a little bit. So um, doing that periodically also helps as well. Right. Is there anything else related to organization? I know we've talked about having the back end fully thought out um, and then also keeping the front end devotees inspired. Is there anything else that you think that if you were like trying to give advice to a new yatra that's trying to organize, what would what would you tell them to incorporate? Yeah, I think uh, what I, one thing that came to mind is just emphasizing why organization is important. And, you know, regardless of whether it's Sankirtan or another service, um, ultimately we want to do our best to serve Guru Krishna uh, to the best of our ability and being organized naturally allows us to do so. Um, one of the ways that I found organization is so helpful is that it really provides devotees with a sense of purpose. You know, everyone's looking for a way to be connected and when they see that there's all these service opportunities available in sankirtan you know whether it's what i mentioned of driving devotees packing books arranging for prashadam whatever it may be um, when devotees take on the service they also they feel really connected that they want to do this each and every week and they look forward to it and then just on top of that i just mentioned it it helps build and strengthen our communities when you see all these service opportunities available and the whole community coming together to engage in, in service as well. And I think last but not least, when we're partaking in any organization effort, it allows us to just improve year over year. Um, you know, right. for example, when we're distributing books, we can see how many books we've distributed, um, where the opportunities are. We can see how many contacts we've gathered, um, how many devotees or how many newcomers we've reached out to, things like that as well. Um, so one thing I would say is just um, for anyone who's looking to get started, that being organized, having a good plan at the start of the year really, really goes a long way in terms of keeping things really well-structured and engaging as many, many people as possible in this um, valuable service. And the organization, the nice thing is there's an opportunity to tap into so many different talents as well. Right. You know, a lot of devotees have varying levels of skill sets. Some may be more numbers oriented. Some may be good at cooking. Some may be good at um, you know distributing books. Whatever it may be, there's an opportunity for everyone in Sankirtan. So it's it's really just presenting it as a way for anyone to get engaged to their desired level. And once they do that, what I've seen is they naturally want to go more and more and sometimes you know we use the term stepping out of one's comfort zone and they'll they'll come towards different areas like book distribution wanting to join the festivals and so forth and one thing i've seen with sankirtan efforts is when we start going frequently and we build you know a connection with someone we've met on the street they'll also come to the temple or 
um, a community or a household gathering and they'll bring that new perspective, that new energy as well. And it just provides that additional level of inspiration to want to go deeper into our own Krishna consciousness, um, deep in our sadhana. So it just has that trickle effect when we organize, we go out on the streets, we engage that, we meet someone um, and they, t they may take up Krishna consciousness quite seriously and it becomes a source of inspiration for the community at large. So it just brings that life and energy into our, our communities as well. Yeah, what you're just talking about, I, I see when I see new people so like committed, um, isn't when you, when you do it a lot, um, when you like start to practice Krishna consciousness and you're still, you still have like material attachments, you may not, you may not be as enthusiastic when you see new people and it's like, they like just saw this, um, you don't, or when they're so excited to chant and drop out, they really like talk about doing those basic stuff. Um, it, they, for them, it's not basic because it's the first time, but for us, we start to think it's basic and then we realize how important it is when we see them so enthusiastic about it. Um, I, I'm sure that's an experience you see a lot on book distribution um, and then cultivating that afterwards. Yes. Can you speak specifically about organization of Srimad Bhagavatam distribution? Um, Badr Purnima is coming up. We have a global goal of 68,000. Um, we're almost hitting um, 100,008 uh, in 2026. So we have about two years and 90 days to go. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, but 90 days basically for this coming Badr Purnima Go. Can you maybe share how Toronto is organizing around that? What are the special things you do just to inspire devotees to distribute Shumit Bhagavatam uh, along those lines? Yeah. Well, it's timely you're asking this question because we're going through our own set of planning here internally at ISKCON Toronto uh, just to figure out how we'll meet our own goal of 379 sets. And one thing I would say, uh, Rancho Prabhu, is that we've seen over the years just new and new different ways of distributing sets. It was almost like, you know, before COVID, um, we had a certain way of distributing sets, which was more focused on um, going door to door, um, partaking in festivals. But then, you know, once we had the experience of being indoors during COVID, it kind of made us redefine our approach towards Bhagavatam set distribution. And, you know, not taking away the outdoor book distribution, that's something we do quite proactively, but bringing on a new layer of additional opportunity that, you know, leverages calling, um, utilizing technology and so forth. So our, our outlook of Srimad Bhagavatam distribution is really quite holistic. We, we have our outdoor book distribution where we go out on the festivals display Bhagavatam, try to attract, um, you know, individuals passing by on speaking about the Bhagavatam, glorifying the Bhagavatam. We have our, you know, other festivals that we have like MSF as well. But on top of that, some new things that we've layered on is, you know, just the whole virtual aspect, you know, like there's a lot of online programs that are happening over Zoom. Um, a lot of members of our community lead different programs. So we connect with them to see if there's an opportunity to present Bhagavatam during a particular class that they're giving. Um, one thing that we've also found really, really helpful, which you may have heard of, is also the calling parties. And, you know, we've gathered a whole list of contacts. Uh, it could be individuals who visited our temples, those that we've met on the streets, and that we've built a relationship with, you know, over the years. And, we allocate some time during each weekend to give them a call to see how they're doing and also making sure that, you know, they're able to visit the temple if they can, if there's any ways we can support them. And then we use it as an opportunity to speak a little bit about Bhagavatam and the importance of Bhadra Purnima. And we just find that all these different ways of use, um, sharing Srimad Bhagavatam, whether it's through book distribution outdoors, whether it's through calling parties, um, whether it's through um, different levels of communication on our WhatsApp groups really helps get the word out. And especially as I like as mentioned, our community is going um, quite um, quickly here in Toronto. And there's a lot of individuals that may have received the Gita, but may not have received Bhagavatam. So we right. definitely make it a habit to display sets during our Sunday feast uh -huh. and presenting it um, to newcomers in terms of 
sharing some of the pastimes narrated in Bhagavatam, building a connection with them, and stressing, of course, mentioned the importance of um, Bhadra Purnima as well. So our planning really touches upon different areas. We've got a dedicated team here in this con Toronto that manage different parts of Bhadra Purnima, um, Bhagavatam set distribution. We have a group that's oriented towards the communication side and marketing side that will put together promotional flyers, um, you know, certain programs that are available, get the word out that way. We've got a group that focuses more on the communication side in terms of connecting with our calling uh, contacts and calling them. So gathering the lists that are required for calling parties, you know, we've got a group that um, will help, you know, put together, you know, website, you know, in details on the website in terms of the group for everything. Yeah. So we've, we've got different mm -hmm. groups and it just helps us bring together everything in a more systematic way. So when I look at Bhadra Purnima, um, it's an opportunity to be innovative, think of fresh new ideas to promote the distribution of Bhagavatam sets and see how many devotees, um, you know, we, if we can engage as much as possible in these different groups that we've established just to bring it together. And of course, um, the inspiration to distribute Bhagavatam also come from reading as well. Right. So that's something that we try to make a habit of, uh, you know, reading Bhagavatam on a consistent basis um, daily if possible. And then feeling that inspiration that when we're sharing, it's through our own reflections and realization that we benefit. Right. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I like how you're capitalizing on the digital digital transformation the world is going through um, and then yeah. and then reaching out for that. Um, I know we've had that discussion about calling parties, but I think um, also starting to just reach out, um, not just be like, hey, do you want to bother with them? But <laughs> then, like, how are you? How's it been going? Um, everything's good. And then we have bar with them as well. Yeah. Uh, that, that's nice. We have all these contacts. So we can do something with them. I'm um, getting upgrading them. Um, I think this is a really good discussion. Is there anything else you'd like to say, Prabhuji, before we before we end? I think, you know, like for me personally, when you asked the question about how I came to Krishna consciousness and um, became engaged in the Toronto Sankirtan team, I often look back and just see what a blissful and valuable service this is. It really is um, enlivening. There's always something to do every week, um, all 52 weeks of the year. And um, even if there's a quieter period, perhaps after a specific campaign like Badra or the marathon, that presents an opportunity to just dive more deeper into the Shastras to read, um, but also to introspect a little bit and see what can we do differently this time around. So it's always provides that opportunity to be active, engage our senses accordingly in Krishna service. And um, one thing that I always seen is that when devotees and newcomers, you know, when they have something to do um, to keep them engaged over the years, it really helps them just stay their course in this path of Krishna consciousness. So I find that the Toronto Sankirtan team or any Sankirtan team in general, um, can really establish this um, into the community of services that are available, um, connecting with devotees, building the relationships, and then naturally everything else flows from there. Thank you so much. I I really like the emphasis on relationships here. Uh, it's the one thing if we if we can organize or not organize relationships, but cultivate relationships, then everything else follows. Uh, but yeah, thank you so much, Prabhuji, for your time. Um, we have many more episodes leading up to Badr Purnima, um, along with this one that we hope inspire you to do really beautiful things this Badra and all and beyond. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next time. Hare Krishna. Shri Prabhupada Ki. Jai. Hare Krishna. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of Sankirtanon. For more resources, visit us at www.distributebooks.com. See you next episode, and remember, carry on, together strong, Sankirtanon.